Uh, thank you, um, uh, Kian Corlin. In the past three months, this pandemic has claimed the lives of nearly 2,200 people on this island. It is with their families and friends that our first thoughts must be today. And we must also remember the nearly 40 people who are today in intensive care units because of COVID-19. The progress of the disease in Ireland has been severe and in some areas worse than in most comparable countries. An unprecedented and rapidly evolving public health emergency leads to mistakes being made. And there is no question but that mistakes were made here and indeed in many countries. Once we are through the pandemic, we would have to take a deep and urgent look at the lessons we should learn. No full understanding will be possible until at least most of Europe reports that the immediate danger has fully passed. At that stage, we will be able to see a comprehensive like-with-like -like comparison of figures and the type of detailed scientific work which you need to explain how a single virus can have radically different impacts in different places and on different groups. It's important to say that from early March onwards, not only have hard questions from politicians and journalists been vitally important uh, in challenging gaps, uh, it, remo it remains so. Uh, as we know from the questions early on on testing and PPE and so on, they were valid uh, and they raised issues. As indeed, in my view, there should have been greater transparency early on in terms of the outbreaks, where our clusters happened, um, and uh, greater information given. Today, our focus has to be on having a substantive discussion about where Ireland goes from here and how quickly we can move to restore as much normality as possible. From the first moments of this pandemic, I and my party have been clear in saying that the primary consideration in policy must be to implement public health advice. However, we've also been clear in saying that there are many options possible while, while respecting this advice. And today, more than at any point in the past three months, the legitimate options for opening closed parts of our social, cultural and economic life are larger than ever. It is deeply unfortunate, in my view, that the government has settled into a kind of rigid approach to deciding on changes and steps. As predicted three weeks ago by most parties here, we have seen three weeks of on and off the record briefings about what might be done, all leading up to a high profile announcement tomorrow to be followed by an already booked marketing campaign. Now, I think this approach is, in my view, causing some difficulties and people in every part of the country are now reporting confusion about what measures are actually in place. The habit of non-stop briefing of, de of decisions yet to be made means that the difference between the headlines and the guidelines grows significantly um, by the day. We need a bit of reality in our discussions today. And when the teacher uh, tomorrow articulates at the press conference, I think we need to hear a far more comprehensive explanation of the current status of the pandemic and the detailed rationale for the restrictions which remain in place. Unfortunately, in a number of communities, we're seeing examples of restrictions being broken. The well publicised uh, situation in Cork, where a whole range of uh, students who want to book houses in a particular area of the city, College Road, Magazine Road, and quite significant house parties, leading to socially distanced protests from residents who've been living there. Uh, and this is happening uh, at an alarming rate. And I think there's no doubt, there's simply no doubt, that compliance is fraying. Uh, and the biggest problem with this is that it's highly divisive. Uh, the majority continue to fully respect the guidelines and the tension between those who ignore the guidelines and those who feel a threat to their health um, cannot be um, ignored. And in many respects, the restrictions are more onerous on those who are complying. Uh, there are people who want to comply literally with this and are. Uh, and then they watch others who uh, have more or less dispensed with, with compliance uh, of, of a lot of them. So the spirit of being in this together can only be protected if we get everyone back on, onto the same agenda. While we cannot be guided only by practice in other countries, it does fall to our government to explain the circumstances when the policies we are pursuing differ significantly from those um, in other countries. We are currently in the absurd situation where it is easier for an Irish person to plan a holiday in much of Europe than it is to plan one here. A range of countries this week signalled their intention to be ready to quickly lift travel restrictions and their tourist industries have begun working on the assumption that travel from Ireland will be possible without quarantine before the high season. Yesterday was announced at a review by the Minister 
uh, Shane Ross, that a review of the aviation sector will be prepared. This is welcome. What is borderline ridiculous, I would suggest, is that it's scheduled to take at least five weeks uh, to complete. Smaller businesses continue to bear the brunt of restrictions, which, which remain severe on their operations, and where there is no clarity about whether or how they can survive. You, you take the hairdressing industry, for example. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence now emerging of a black economy developing, and people have just gone on doing it informally, um, and that the you know, legitimate operators are being uh, marginalised as a result. So I think greater engagement is, is, is required uh, in relation to that. And I think there is a growing divide between a message which, on the one hand, says things are going well, and on the other hand, tells us that Ireland is not yet ready to follow other countries. Um, I, think Tishik, uh, I think it's important that the government, uh, and in tomorrow's announcement, would uh, explain, and I, I would ask you to explain, would like you to explain, the exact position in relation to the five tests uh, for reopening which NEFIT recommended to you in April. The first test is the general progress of the disease. According to the briefings, the disease is under control and the reproduction number is actually significantly lower than in many countries which have largely reopened. The community spread of the disease in recent weeks is very small and dramatically lower than it was in March um, or April. And in fact, if community transmission is this low, then I think many of the travel re restrictions in place don't make uh, as much sense as they did when they were originally introduced. There are 1,300, I think, active COVID cases of COVID-19 at the moment, meaning that 95% of the total for positive tests are no longer active cases. So, Tishik, what exactly is the specific benchmark for the progress of the disease, which has to be reached um, before most restrictions can be raised? The second test is a healthcare capacity and resilience one. Today, the system is dealing with fewer than one quarter of the cases which it was handling at the height of the pandemic. The government and public health officials have repeatedly stated that the capacity and resilience is there. The third test has also been achieved according to the government. The capacity to test and trace is, we have been repeatedly told, in place. And in fact, there has apparently been significant excess um, testing capacity. The fourth test is the ability to shield at-risk groups. This is something which has not been fully outlined. However, it appears that the preferred policy for this here and internationally relates to advice for people in high-risk groups concerning their behaviour. And this is something which is not relevant to the bulk of restrictions in place today. The final test, and increasingly one of great concern, is the risk of secondary morbidity, or people who may die because of other illnesses, which are caused or are not diagnosed or treated because of pandemic-related um, restrictions. No data on this has been published, but what we do know is that the numbers attending for diagnostic procedures have fallen dramatically, as have those attending medical appointments. Today, roughly 1,000 beds in the, our public acute hospital system are empty, and close to 50% of the capacity of private hospitals was unused as of Monday. Unless we are to believe that something radical has changed in the progress of other diseases and the importance of early detection and, and treatment, there is now no doubt that we are facing into more people's lives being in danger because of the lower levels of medical services being um, accessed. Augustus Lear, Uncle Ston Dalar Verenschkel, a Gwildinig Follentonish, Le Galler, Ella, Nach will the Scherfishi, Slain to Erfoildoiv, Dini Le Eilsche, Dini Le Galler Cree, Augustus Alon, Galler, Ella. Agus tá dain sé ar an gomhaig a saol é imuel, gomhaig na dhíne sé imuel gan na sheirfíosí. Sé agus is léir gomhaig plan tachtacht a uing agus gomhaig gheartha an inis plan crimse hoc a chur a vain con dailail leis an five sé. In addition, we also need to understand the growing evidence of serious mental health and psychosocial problems emerging in many countries. The World Bank and the OECD have both also outlined evidence of a profound gender basis for this issue, with women carrying a much heavier economic and social burden. Teacher, what we need is clarity about how exactly the five tests are being implemented. The public deserves the full details. And if it is the case that NEFED and the government believe that Ireland is behind other countries for a reason, that reason needs to be outlined in detail, not generalities. As I said here every week, the failure to provide any assurances to state companies and institutions about their finances is unacceptable. Public transport and higher education are, for example, facing new deficits of an unprecedented scale, but they've received no support. And in many cases, are now reading anonymous briefings about how they need to look after themselves. And this has to stop. And I've been consistently making the point that third level education is in a real crisis because of the depletion of revenues uh, from sources that they had increasingly relied on in recent years. And to me, third-level education 
and research is key to economic recovery and sustained uh, economic development in this country. It always has been. Um, and I think the responses so far from the department uh, have, have, have been, in my view, unacceptable in terms of there's no, the lack of engagement of any kind. We still have roughly a million people, I'll just conclude, on some form of state support for their income. We have thousands of businesses and entire industries who do not know what they're facing into. We have a growing divide in the population between the majority who are silently abiding by all restrictions and others who are not. We also have an unexplained divide between measures taken here and those taken in comparable countries. We need full transparency. We need our government to give all of the details behind its decisions and we need it to understand that the only way of retaining public support for restrictions is to be far more open about the exact basis for the choices which are being made. Thank, Thank you. you.